Welcome again, saints of the Most High Yah. Let me pray for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, December 18th lesson. Father, we thank you for bringing us to today. Lord God, we just uh, bless your name, Lord, that you even thought, uh, Lord, that we're just even a thought, Lord, in your mind. You're created in uh, image, Lord, you brought us. Uh, Lord, as they, old folks said, from a mighty, mighty long way, Jesus, we just praise you. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, Lord, we're still here in the land of living, Lord, able, Lord, to just uh, have our, our minds, have our mental health right now. And even if we're struggling in those areas, Lord, keep, Lord, trying to keep our minds focused on you. Lord, give us peace and understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, saints, before we go forward on the December 18th lesson today, I want you to go down and I want you to subscribe to this channel and I want you to like this video. Amen. And today is lesson three, December 18th, uh, 2022. God prepares the way. John prepares the way. Now, uh, the version reading is John chapter 1, 29 through 42. And remember, obviously, there was a disciple John and there was a prophet John. We don't have any Necessary, necessarily book written by the prophet John the Baptist, but the disciple John, we do. We want to be clear about that background. Uh, scripture, Luke 3, 1 through 20, and in John 1, print passages, Luke 3, 3, 2 through 6, 15 through 18. The key verse says this, and it's Luke 3, 3. He came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance uh, for the remission of sins. And before we go, uh, Saints to lesson. I'm going to go back once and as our as we open this new series of Sunday school lessons uh, I'm going to keep these videos at 29 minutes 59 seconds or less the full Sunday school lesson 29 minutes 59 seconds or less. I want it to be impactful uh, For you. So again 29 59 or less and I also each week going forward Lord willing and if I live I'm gonna do a 9 minute 59 second or less uh, review of these uh, uh, Sunday school lessons as well. Amen. So when we go back just one week, we're not going, I'm not going back two weeks anymore. Just one week, Zechariah is redeemed. And we remember that one of the things with Zechariah, and for those of you before I go there, so sorry, uh, you could skip forward to the nine minute, 30 second, or between nine minutes, 30 seconds and 10 minute mark uh, to just get today's lesson. So you could skip forward right now if you just want today's lesson without last week's review. But before you go, these things, these lessons build on top of one another. Brother teachers have done such a Holy Ghost job of putting these things together and they build on top of one another. And, and saints, we, we got to get a clearer picture from the mind of God. And the way we do that is understanding that the scripture Romans, for we do know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and for the good of them that are called according to his purpose. That begins with his word. How's what we know? Amen. So December 11th, Zachariah's redeemed. What we, Zachariah, we knew uh, as the father of John, Elizabeth was John's mother. And remember that the birth of the forerunner of Jesus is prophesied in the Old Testament. There was going to be a forerunner, um, Elijah-like person. And Jesus actually had the discussion with somebody if uh, and said this, well, he is, John the Baptist is Elijah, if you were receiver or the forerunner basically of the Messiah, right? The Mashiach, the Messiah. So, and that was obviously Jesus. So John's birth came about for, for a woman that was past the age of bearing. Now, and that didn't necessarily mean she could never bear. Like there was barren women in the Bible, like Hannah, the mother of Samuel, uh, like uh, Sarah, the wife of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So we have these, these barren women bringing forth these miraculous children in the Bible. So it didn't necessarily say, now that I read, please correct my doctrine, that she could never bear children. It was just she was past the time of bearing. So we don't know if John had siblings or anything like that. We don't know. But it would be as if a woman was well past what we would call today menopause. And yet, boom, something miraculous happened. When we think about that, she was past the time of childbearing. John's birth came through by a miracle, basically. And Zachariah was kind of struggling with this whole concept. So God, nine months, well, before the birth, a long time, months before the birth, God shut Zachariah's mouth uh, as a witness kind of against what he, his failings, however you want to do that. But remember, though, God chastises those he's loved. Uh, or when John was born, Zachariah, his father actually wrote on, confirmed uh, his wife Elizabeth's name, which was John for the child right? So then God opened his mouth back up and, and saints, this was the big point on that. 
uh, the applicability. When we think about uh, God's promises being fulfilled, there are times when we don't believe that God is going to fulfill his promise. We, we just tired of waiting. Even, even Abraham, whereby, Lord, will I know that I will have a son, you know, or that I will have descendants because this man, Eliezer's Damascus is in my house. I ain't got no child. And God will confirm those things. But what we don't want to do is slip into a place of believing we know when, how, when and how God's going to fulfill his promise. The issue becomes we can, we associate the when and how with the if, that if clause, if God's going to fulfill his promise. No, 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 no. When and how is the question if God promised it, right? He's not a man, the Bible says, that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. And further than that, uh, you remember that conversation that, that between Abraham and the three men on the plane that came walking towards him. And the man said, uh, next year, where's your wife Sarah? Next year this time, she's going to have a child. And Sarah laughed, <laughs> which Isaac was named after that laughter, right? And the question by one of those, those people or one of the, the, the beings, supernatural beings there uh, was, uh, is anything too hard for God? And the question, no, nothing is too hard for God. So when we talk, it's always, we can ask Lord when and how, that's okay. But you have to be okay with knowing that he might not answer that, right? We can't associate that as the, with the if, because if become, slips us to a place of unbelief, right? Because the when and how often overwhelm us to, into the place of the if, if you will. The second thing that I wanted to share with you before we move forward here uh, on this lesson uh, was, was the reality that nothing is too hard for God to fulfill and your prayers must line up with God's will. Prayers are answered when our request aligns with God's will, and that is the very definition of a blessing, right? When we talk about prayers aligning with God's will, that's the only way blessings kind of can happen if we request them. Now, we know God blesses us all the time for things we didn't ask for. Don't get what I'm saying wrong. But once we get on this journey and we start understanding and God opens our mind, right? It's got, we have got to get to a place where we can accept that he is going to answer it according to his will. Remember, Jesus said this. Jesus said, ask anything in my name and it will be given. The issue becomes we're asking things that are not in his name to consume upon the lust of our flesh, right? Another text says, you have not because you ask not or or you don't have because you want to consume on the lust of your flesh. God's not going to give you anything necessarily that's going to destroy you in the beginning. Now, I'm not going to ever say God's not going to give you anything that's going to destroy you. That's not what I'm going to say because we know better than that. And we know better than that because when it came to Saul, God, the, the people of Israel came to Samuel the prophet and said, we want a king like the other nations that we could see. Samuel said, I wouldn't do that. This, this, this is why. God said, listen, tell them this. Samuel told them that. They said, give us a king anyway. And God told Samuel, it's not you they rejected, but it's me, right? This is what he said when Samuel mourned. He was, well, he was vexed for him. And then he was vexed for Saul some years later. So I want not to conflate those two. However, I do want to say this is that Saul took them through things. They went to wars with Saul. People were killed unnecessarily because of Saul in the nation of Israel all of these things. So God eventually gave them what they wanted that destroyed them. But what I'm saying here today is if you seek the heart of God, there's some things probably that you prayed for that haven't happened that you need to let go of and even repent that you asked for. That wasn't the question, the case here with Zechariah being redeemed, because there's some things that God wants to do in your life that's going to bless somebody far beyond your lifetime. Amen. And back to today again. December 18th, and welcome back uh, to those who are joining us uh, and who skipped over the review process. Lesson three, December 18th, John prepares the way. The devotional reading is John 1, 29 through 42, and the background scripture is Luke 3, 1 through 20, and John 1. The print passage is Luke 3, 2 through 6, and then 15 through 18, and the key verse, he went into uh, Luke 3, 3, he went into all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness uh, of sin. And we remember that John's calling. He was born to prepare the way for Jesus and then to get out of Jesus's way. And I said this uh, on a former lesson is one of the blessings of a true prophetic ministry, uh, the ministry of a true prophet, not church prophets, 
not these church prophets. I, I saw something not long ago that I was really disturbed by. And this, this guy came um, and he passed and he was doing this part of the service. And he passed the word and said, give this person a prophetic word. Just like, it was absurd. It was absurd. So I'm not talking about those kind of prophets, church prophets. I'm talking about real prophets. One thing that real prophets of God, and they're, they're few, they're in the land today. Remember, God raised, even in the black, even within uh, the black faith community, God raises up prophets when they are needed from within the nation they are needed. And we know that that's to be true. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Can't forget our brother Deacons, uh, right? In, in that as well, over from first, remember I taught you God works in sixes. So we'll talk about that another time. But prophets are needed and the real ones, they prepare the way for the man of God. They actually, and sister prophets as well. I know you hardcore Baptists, many of you don't believe that women shouldn't preach. And I am a pastor of one of your churches. And I'm here to tell you, when we talk about preaching and prophesying, that's one thing. Pastoring, that's another conversation. Welcome again, saints. It is your dearest servant, Brother Pastor Brian Dale. I am asking you right now to go to the description section of this video and click the link for sermondownload.net. We want you to take the next step. We buy, you buy devotionals, you buy Bible studies, you buy books from religious leaders, all of these things, we want you to go straight to the source, into the mind of God, which are pastoral sermon notes. That's where these things originate at. So you can see straight into the process and how God deals with us as we deliver our word. These are good for Sunday morning preaching. All you can do is just print and preach. They're ready to go. You can pull them up on any device, smartphone, all the way up to your tablet devices. You can also use them as Bible study content as well. Further, if you lean into that a bit further, we have a 104 sermon package where you can download 104 sermons and saints, you could turn this into books, devotionals, our notes are thorough, they're doctrinal, they're theological. We want you to go to sermondownload.net by clicking in the link, the description section of this video. So be it. Don't get it confused, believing that preaching is pejorative to pastoring. Preaching and prophesying and pastoring are two separate things. A pastor is no better than a prophet. That's where we get confused. And that's where a lot of our uh, sisters, they get, get confused and think God called them to pastor because they think pastors are the creme de la creme. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says Ephesians chapter four, apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Likewise, also deacon. Now deacons are called by the people. Well, these other five are called by God, but they still make up six. And that's where you get confused. All those gifts, according to Ephesians 4, to edify the body, and all of them are needed. So I'll get off of that uh, just to un just so we can uh, get back to where we need to. But please remember, saints, in all things, we have to stick to sound doctrine. Lesson names, recognize the ministry of John as the fulfillment of prophecy and preparing the way for Jesus' ministry. To finish that thought, a real prophet prepares the way for the man of God, and then he gets out of the way. Even our sister prophets who cry out words of correction, right? On They can cry out words of correction on men because we know Deborah did, uh, the judge, in old, and, and she was a prophetess, and she was married. There was a prophet named Holder. We know that Anna in the New Testament went down temple prophesying and preaching. So so even women, sister prophets, can speak a word of, of authority. And y'all, that, that mission, using Paul's saying, I don't suffer a woman, uh, to be in a church and usurp authority over man, we can talk. He was dealing with the local body. He was dealing with the local body and the office and, and the church, the, uh, the pastoring and those things. And he was also dealing with an issue in the church because if you go over a couple of chapters in Corinthians, what you will find out is Paul said, okay, if you're going to prophesy, sisters, this is how you do it. Your head cover, blah, 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 blah. So we need to stop that nonsense. So I said that, uh, that a prophet prepares the way and they get out of the way. So if you believe you're called, and I'm going to move on here, to the ministry of a prophet, you better be sure. Those are heavy words. And if they are, I can tell you this. You are to prepare the way for the man of God, even if God puts you in a local body, as he's put me in a local body. But when the man of God comes, you've prepared the way, and then you need to get out of the way. That's not saying, let me be clear here, prophet that you get out of the way for every false 
uh, for, for these fake Negro preachers, every one of them that show up in, in the church. And also people that are pastor before that show up to try to be some associate minister at your church. That's not what I'm saying. And you better be careful of them. And you better confront them early. And you better confront them often. But what I'm saying is God, and he's made it known to me, right? He's made made, made my mission known to me in, in visions and dreams. So what I'm saying is when a man of God comes up, prophet, if you're a real prophet, like John, you prepare the way and you get out of the way. Will you trust God enough to walk away after you've prepared the way for the man of God and to step down. Value, and lesson name number two, value ways in which John was obedient to God's call on his life. Preparing the way and getting out of the way. Compare the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. Ooh, ooh wow, wow. Thank you, brother teacher. I need to be, I need, I need to learn that. I never thought about that comparison. That's heavy, man. Ooh, ooh. Introduction. Note this story by Reverend Dr. Janice Hunt. My dad grew up in a quake. Now she's a reverend. Whatever that means. A historic town in Massachusetts. It is one that dates to uh, the dates in the graveyard date back to before the Revolutionary War and result. It is a place where it seems historically it's literally to historically is literally to be discovered around every corner. It's been years since I visited Marblehead, this Marblehead Mass, Mass. But as I sat with the urgency of this week's lessons, I was reminded of a story about making paths straight. For you see, this is not a town where the streets are laid out on a grid. Rather, they wind up and down around paving, having simply replaced a muddy, rocky pass which horses and carts once navigated. Specifically, this is what I recall. The story behind the house, the left front corner of the house, cut out. Now it is likely that this accommodation was made when it was discovered that it would be easier for coal wagons to make their way down the street without the corner on that house. So the so it was cut out. Another theory goes that removing it made the flow easier of water and sewage. However, the story that that has stuck is this. In 1824, General Marquis Lafayette came to visit and uh, in the French had deep ties. Uh, in America from the time of the Revolutionary War uh, all the way up, uh, wow, to Louisiana Purchase. So now this particular house sits at the corner of 5 Conversion Street. It was a rainy day, and the, the mud alone made it hard for the horses to navigate. They could not make the turn, and so legend has it that someone took an axe and started chopping away the corner of the house, making it possible for a general to pass. And to this day, it is known as the Lafayette House. Now all logic would argue the veracity of the story. And yet, true or not, it brings to mind the urgent exhortation of John, doesn't it? It speaks to John's task and our task as Christians of making the way plain, plain for others so that Christ may come into their lives. And the biblical, uh, the analysis of the biblical text, he preached the word Luke 3, 3, 2 through 6. Ananias and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the word of Esaias, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Every valley shall be field and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough way shall be made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God and we know that 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 happened uh, well, with the sacrifice and resurrection and ascension of Jesus amen now the description says because I want to read this is one description I'm going to read we just have a few more minutes here John a member of a prominent priestly family was called to the ministry from his mother's womb he was he had likely been aware of the call upon God on his life for many years, and we know he was, whether it was conscious or subconscious. And you know how old and Mary came, and Jesus was in Mary's womb, and the as soon as Mary spoke, the Bible says that the baby in Elizabeth's womb, John leapt, <laughs> leapt. Well, he left. Also, yeah, from six months from six months in the womb, <laughs> John was aware. Whether uh, now going up consciously, unconsciously, he was uh, he was aware. John began his ministry not in the cities but in the countryside, ministering most likely in small villages to the poor outcast people who struggled to survive and pressed their way under great duress and and to attend the holy festivals in Jerusalem. John's message from the Lord was short and simple, bold and personal. Repent so that God may forgive your sins. And that is just 
it. Repent so God may forgive your sins. So let's put that. We can't just leave that there because remember, this was before uh, Jesus' mission was complete with his resurrection and then, you know, ascension and that. And we got to put that together. Repent. Lord, I'm sorry for that. Lord, I, I turn from this. And it says right here, may God forgive uh, so that God may forgive you of your sins. So God will forgive. So when we put that forward with Jesus, we understand that when John baptized Jesus, G three years ministry, Jesus hung. Uh, he hung up on the cross. He died. He rose on the third day morn so that our sins could be covered with his sinless life. So don't forget John's preaching could not be separate from Jesus's mission. Right. Remember, it isn't the blood. It's the life in the liquid. Right. It's the life in the blood. Jesus is sinless life contained in the blood that covers us. That's how we can be presented faultless is be covered in the life of Jesus. What do you think? Unlike John and Jesus, many preachers, many preachers focus their messages on Bible topics that are non-confrontational. What is the risk to the church when preachers lack the courage or conviction to preach a strong message of repentance and forgiveness of sin? This is the problem. The issue is, I, I, yeah, I'm going to spend time here and then I'll read these last little bit because I'm going to spend the rest of my time here because that's what he wrote, this writer here. People leave church. They never experience God. They're never convicted of their sin and they don't repent and people die and they go to hell. That's the problem with non-confrontational preaching. They say stuff. I was at a funeral. There were uh, hundreds of lost people at this funeral. Th this preacher got up and he made a joke out of hell. He said, you know, you want to accept Jesus because you don't want to go to the smoking section. Everybody start laughing. Not only did most of the people not understand what he meant, people laughed and he missed an opportunity. And I know people died. They left and died. I know for a fact. When you lack the courage to preach, you are offending the throne of God and you are not doing what you say you were called to do. But here is God's mercy preaching. There's another gifting in the church, and it goes to this lesson about John the prophet that will preach this message. But oftentimes you run them out of your churches and they're prophets of God. Now, is a prophet biblically to sit under a pastor? No, absolutely not. Pastors, prophets go to war with pastors because pastors try to bridle these wild men and these wild women who are made to be confrontational. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, as somebody that God gave that gifting to, if, you, if that prophet doesn't have a war to fight, pastor, he's going to start fighting you. But I'm saying this, don't avoid the real prophets of God, not these fake church prophets that tell you God's going to bless you and you want to invite them back. How many prophets in the Bible show me prophets in the Bible that were welcomed back and welcomed with open arms after they preached a message? You'll find the exact opposite to be true. So, Pastor, even if you don't have the nerve, and you don't, most of you don't have the nerve to say what needs to be said in a way it needs to be said. Let me put it like that, without joking, without qualifying it, some folk, and all this other garbage. There are There is gifting in the church, and that's why God sends prophets, so that they will say what you may not even be gifted to say in a way you are gifted to say it. So what is the risk? This is what do you think to the church when preachers lack the courage and conviction to preach a strong message of repentance. People die, they go to hell, but God still makes provision through people like John the Baptist. And there are modern day John the Baptists. He reached the world. And this is Luke 3, 15 through 18. This last set of verses is, is the people were in expectation and all men mused in the hearts. John, whether he were Christ or not, John answered saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I come in, the latches of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fan is his hands, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and he will gather the wheat into the garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in exhortation preached he unto the people. Now, John even knew that he said he wasn't, he was unworthy to unlatch this coming Messiah's shoes. And when John baptized him, do y'all remember what John said to Jesus? I have need to be baptized of you, Lord, and you're coming to me. And Jesus said, suffer it to be so, for we have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Even Jesus was baptized. So I want to tell you all this, and we can talk about if somebody's on their deathbed later and they can't make it to the water. 
If you could go down in the water, you need to get to the water. And that's not this sprinkling garbage. Get to the water. Because even John chapter 3, people said, all you got to do is believe. But read earlier in John chapter 3, right? So I just want to say that. But the, the bigger idea here is that the prophet, I want you all to grab this, students of God's word. Ain't nobody else going to deal with this. They're not equipped to. The prophet prepares the way for the pastor oftentimes or the preacher or the shepherd. Let's say it like that, the shepherd. The prophet prepares the way for them. That is what God called us to do. So I'm saying this is that it takes a certain humility to serve in whatever role that God would have you. Will you get out of the way when God has somebody coming forward? And I'm saying this to all of us who's gifted with knowledge, wisdom, not preachers, just God's people in general. Is God using you in some ministry at in your home, on your job to prepare the way for somebody and then you get out of the way and maybe they get to get up in the limelight. Will you love God enough for that? Will you do that? I had a sister in our church. I don't say her name. But she, I, I said, sister, pray about this. And she did it for a little while. And she was kind of in the limelight up talking. And she came and she said, pastor, I just want to be in the background and serve. I don't want to be in the limelight. Oh, well, I'm going to say her name, Sister Gary. <laughs> I was like, oh. Oh, Sister Gary, Sister Gary. Y'all better buy some of her cakes too. Sister Gary's cakes are ridiculous, man. Woo! But I said that to understand that there's many ways to serve, right? What is your way to serve? Are you to prepare the way and get out of the way? What do you think? Has the Holy Spirit prompted and emboldened you to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus with others? Finally, preachers, wherever you are, and we're all to preach the gospel to somebody, Go out on the street corners, go out in the marketplaces, share Jesus on your job. Some people, God has equipped you to door knock. Now, I'm a hardcore street preacher, getting your face confrontational preacher, but that knocking doors, man, that's a whole nother level of personal. So some of you knock doors and uh, this ministry uh, locally here uh, in Wadu, Iowa, Gift of Life Church, man, they like prepare these cool bags and they go up and give them to people. Uh, and, and then witness to Jesus. I mean, just a whole nother level, right? So whatever it is, you need to be emboldened, especially in this nuclear war threat and Jesus is being on his way. We need to be bold in the things of God, just like John, to prepare the way for even Jesus to enter somebody's heart through a simple witness one-on-one. -on -one. Let me pray for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this lesson today, Lord. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we magnify you. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the witness of uh, Lord John the Baptist. Father, I just praise your name for, uh, Lord, that ministry, Lord, the ministry of Jesus. Lord, I praise the ministry of, the, of those who will prepare the way, Lord, for someone else today. Father, may they, they be emboldened in your name to preach and share you, even if they don't think they're preachers, but at least a witness to somebody else. In Jesus' name, amen. And so be it.